Why do we have lighting in the saltwater aquarium? It's really for two reasons. The first is just so it looks nice, and the second is for photosynthesis for the corals. Types of aquarium lighting, I actually have a lot to show you guys, but to make it look somewhat decent, let me just set up the studio I'm gonna use today, and then I'll pull out all the lights and kind of explain them. I only use LEDs, so let me just show you some of the LED options that I have. These would be inexpensive Chinese black box lights. You know, a couple hundred dollars, you can't really program them, but they work fine. And then your second kind of lights are programmable lights. These are, are reef breeders lights, and these ones are awesome. You can see they're really sleek. And then a third style LED I have is this Kessel A80, really simple. You can turn it on and off the intensity here. You can also control the color spectrum from more blue to more white. Second type of aquarium lighting, high output T5 lamps. They're really great. They're really small fluorescent lamps, see that? And so you can put reflectors all the way around them so the light really does just point down. This one over here is gonna be your 10,000K and this one over here is gonna be your blue actinic to really make those fluorescent colors pop. It's a Coral Life high output T5, it's called the Aqualite. This is a really affordable version. So you have LEDs, T5s, then you have metal halides, compact fluorescence, and then hybrids, which is a combination. Metal halides have been standard in the hobby for a long time, although you don't find them as much. They take up a lot of power and they burn really hot, but they have a proven track record. The fourth is a power compact fluorescent. Basically, you take a fluorescent bulb and you put it into like this, this U shape, less power, they work fine. I would say they're not very common because they don't put out a lot of light. And lastly is a hybrid. The most common hybrid fixture I see is a mixture of LED lights, with those T5s on the side. When it comes to styles of lights, you really have, have two styles. You have like a long strip and then you have a puck. Here, let me show you. Here's an example of a long strip. Another example of a strip. You know what, let me just pull them all out. No discussion of lights would be complete unless you talk about PAR, P-A-R. PAR is photosynthetic active radiation, and it is light within the visible range of 400 to 700 nanometers. For example, every light you're gonna buy for the aquarium is gonna have something like this. See all those numbers there in the middle and on the edges? Those are the PAR numbers, and that tells you how much photosynthetic active radiation this light's gonna put out based on the different height. For example, on this Coral Life Aqualite, they give you a couple diagrams here. This is the actinic, and this puts out light at about 420, and then this is the 10,000K. You can see it's a much more broad spread. If you're just gonna do a fish-only tank, honestly, PAR doesn't really matter that much because your fish don't require a certain kind of lighting to thrive. Anytime you wanna think about corals, then you need to think about how much light do I need. Soft corals and large polyp stony corals that we talked about in the previous video, those are on the low end of the PAR spectrum, from like 50 to 100. If you end up venturing into the SPS, the small polyp stony corals, those have a much higher light requirement of like 250 to 350 PAR. So how do you know how much PAR your light puts out? Well, you can rent or purchase a PAR meter. These are like 400 to $600. You can fine tune and map out exactly what the PAR is at different settings in different parts of your tank. Or you can go online to different manufacturer websites or different forums and people have done the testing for you. The visible light spectrum is basically the wavelength of light that human eyes can see. Especially with LED panels, you're gonna see a lot of different colors on that panel. You're gonna see different shades of blue, like cool blue, blue, 
royal blue, there's reds, there's greens, and then there's white. One of the secrets is white light contains all of the colors in the spectrum, but several blue lights are also really heavy in par and good for coral growth. How to schedule your lights? Well, let me just show you the few ways that I do it from a really, really simple timer all the way up to a fancy controller. If you're going on the most budget friendly range when it comes to timers, you're just gonna get a simple digital timer and connect it into some inexpensive lights. You know, like those Chinese black box lights, the Coral Life lights are also pretty cheap. They just have a simple on and off. So what you can use, and what I use, several of them, these simple electric timers, they're really inexpensive. You can just set them to go on and off and as an inexpensive way to automate your lights. The second way of automating your lights is to purchase a fixture that comes with a controller. For example, these reef breeders, you can control them here. All right, see, turn them on and off. The final way to program your lights is to buy a smart fixture that comes with an app, like the AI Primes. So if you look here, you just log in, you can click control on the bottom, and then you can see the schedule I've set up, which is just automatic. One of the biggest problems with scheduling is like knowing as a beginner how to schedule and for how long to schedule. Let's jump into the computer real quick and I'll show you a couple places you can go for suggestions and for help. When it comes to finding your schedules, there's a couple places I like to go. The first is Reef to Reef. Just go on search and like type in your light. So let's try AI Prime Lighting Schedule. Click enter and you'll see a ton of threads pop up. So you can just browse what other people have done. Another really good source is go to ecotechmarine.com and click on the top on Coral Lab. So if you go down to Spectrum and Par, download the link, you can scroll down for their various lighting programs. I'd say probably the most popular one out there right now is the SPS AB Plus. You can download the schedule, you can just follow along on here. It's been a really long proven track record of success. What are my recommendations for lights? Please remember one thing is that I focus content for beginners. So I'm not gonna be choosing the most expensive light out there. I'm trying to get beginners a good quality product that's affordable so they can get into the hobby quickly. My first recommendation is just a cheap Chinese black light. There's all sorts of different brands out there. I think this one's called Luxburg. Simple, on and off, they will grow corals, they'll be just fine less than $100. My second recommendation and the one that I use on all my tanks, like right back here, is the Reef Breeder Photon V2s. These are middle range price wise. They come in different sizes, a really slick fixture and programmable using the controller that comes with it. My third recommendation for a small tank are these Kessel A80s. These are good for 10, 20 gallon tanks, affordable. I think they're less than $150, but they're really high quality light. My fourth recommendation on the fancier programmable end are the AI Primes. This is an older version. They have newer versions now. They make this small puck one. They make larger ones as well. These are awesome because they're completely programmable and controllable with your phone. And my fifth and final recommendation, if you don't want to go with LEDs, is the Coralife Aqualite T5. T5s are so easy to use. You can put it on a simple timer and it's virtually automated. What I like about these is they are foolproof. You don't have to worry about programming every single individual LED light. Just turn it on, turn it off, and you're done. We're gonna talk heating and cooling. Let's start with heaters. There are glass heaters, like the Eheim Jaeger. There are titanium heaters, and then there's inline heaters. When it comes to size of heaters, really, you just don't want to overpower. So get the right size heater for the gallons of your system. We're gonna do a little test using two of the heaters. We're gonna use the Phoenix titanium heater, and we're gonna use the Eheim Jaeger. 
The Phoenix Titanium is rated for tanks up to 30 gallons, while the Eheim Jaeger is rated for tanks up to 16 gallons. So theoretically, the titanium heater should heat twice as fast. On almost all of my systems, I use some sort of controller. A controller basically allows you to really dial in the temperature of your tank. If you're just gonna be using a regular heater, it has an internal thermometer, which will turn on and turn off at a certain point, which usually means your water temperature is gonna sway by one or two degrees. But if you wanna get really accurate, what you can do is either buy something like the Phoenix that comes with a controller, or you can buy something like this Inkbird. Another factor to consider with heaters is redundancy. And what I mean is if your heater gives out and you don't have some sort of temperature controller or alert system, your temperature could go from 78 to like 60 degrees overnight, killing all of your livestock. I always buy two heaters for every single one of my systems. I set the first one to be at 78 degrees and I set the second one to be at 76 degrees. That means if this one ever gives out, the other secondary backup will kick on once it gets to 76 degrees, meaning it's only a two degree drop. My choices for heater, I am just a huge fan of either the Eheim Jaeger. I also really like the Titanium Phoenix heater. For cooling your aquarium, you have two choices, a simple fan, they make like special fans like this one, tunes the aqua wind, and all you're trying to do is you're trying to use evaporative cooling to blow air across the surface of your aquarium. Your other option, if a fan just isn't cutting it, is to get a chiller. There's two types of chillers. There's like big half horsepower, full horsepower, quarter horsepower chillers that are these basically giant air conditioners that sit next to your aquarium. Or for a smaller tank, you can get something like this, the Chill Solutions Thermoelectric Chiller. This is rated for up to like 30 gallons. The footprint of this is extremely small and can do a good job if you live in a hot environment. Finally, we're on to circulation. Let's start out with the types of pumps that are available. First category of pump is a power head or utility pump. These are usually smaller pumps. They have a fixed rate. You can use them to help pump water between five gallon buckets, or you can even use them in a small tank like this 40 gallon to provide a little bit extra flow. You have wave makers, and a wave maker really can be an AC pump or a DC pump. It can have a fancy controller or just a simple on and off controller. And a wave maker is any type of pump that does some sort of pulse to recreate the currents in the ocean. A return pump is used to return the water to your main display. For example, you could use a utility pump that we already talked about as your primary return pump if your tank is small enough. Next, you have an air pump. An air pump just helps provide air bubbles into your tank. A battery powered air pump can be really handy if your power ever goes out so you can keep your livestock alive. And lastly, you have dosing pumps. Dosing pumps, usually called peristaltic pumps, are used to dose things like two-part solution or caulkwasser or magnesium or other supplements into your tank. A dosing pump has a really small rate of flow. Basically, you're adding drops into your tank at a time, which is perfect if you're dosing small amounts of things. Whatever pump you're getting, there are certain specifications to think about to see if it's gonna be right for the application you need it for. First of all, pumps can either be submersible or external, some of which can be both. Submersible means that it goes in the water, and external pump means you just don't put it in the water, but you put it outside of the water. Then you have AC-DC pumps. It's the alternating current and direct current pumps. In the hobby, most inexpensive pumps are AC pumps. They work pretty well, they use a little bit more energy and their vibration is a little bit higher so you can oftentimes hear them a little bit more. DC pumps are quieter and they're also controllable so you can set the percentage you want them on. DC pumps are really often used in wave makers and they're often used in return pumps to control the exact amount of flow you want. Then you gotta consider gallons per hour. You want to have a pump that is powered enough for your system. So for example, if I had a 10 gallon tank, I would wanna make sure that the pump was at least 100 to 150 gallons per hour. 
Then you got hard plumbing and soft plumbing when it comes to pumps. Pretty self-explanatory, hard plumbing is anything with PVC. Soft plumbing is some sort of flexible tubing, whether that's a vinyl or whether that's a silicone. We're gonna test seven pumps for flow and for power, unless it doesn't make sense. For example, the air pump, we're just gonna show you how it works, and the dosing pump, we're just gonna show you how it works. Let's get started. Okay, that was the Danner Supreme OxyFlow. They don't rate these by gallons per hour, just by PSI, so it's two PSI. Number two is the Camelware X1 dosing pump. Again, flow rate doesn't really matter here, nor does the power of the pump. You're really just trying to get accuracy somewhere between one milliliter and 6,000 milliliters per hour. <laughs> This was the easiest to set up and to program and to calibrate. From my initial use, I definitely give this Camor X1 dosing pump a big thumbs up. We got five more pumps to test, and all five of these we're gonna test for flow and for power. This is extremely unscientific. Our first up is gonna be the Hydor Corellia, definitely the least expensive option. This thing puts out 240 gallons per hour, really affordable good for small tanks. Number two is the CJ Synchra Silent 1.0. It does 251 gallons per hour. This is a return pump. It's not meant to be a wave maker, but we're gonna attach it to show you how much flow it puts out, and then we'll do the power test. Next up is my personal favorite utility pump, the Cobalt MJ1200. It puts out 295 gallons per hour, so just a little bit more than the CJ Synchra Silent 1.0. Next up is the Reef Octopus Varios 2. This is a DC return pump, so you can control the flow rate. This one has a maximum output of 792 gallons per hour. Last up is the Max Spec Gyre. This is the XF330 with the controller. This thing is a beast. It can put out 2,350 gallons per hour. Because of its long length, it can put out a ton of flow across a wide expanse of your tank. Now we're gonna test the power of these pumps by sending the flow vertical. Now I know for wave makers, it really doesn't make any sense, but let's try it anyways and just see how much vertical strength they have. Hydor Corellia, the budget friendly one, perfect for a nano tank. Now we got my favorite AC return pump, the CJ Synchra Silent Line. This is the 1.0. My favorite utility pump, the MJ1200. Now we got the Reef Octopus Varios. Last up is the Max Spec Gyre. 